Please join me in our opening prayer. Lord, as we walk through the doors of this place of worship, through your eye with us, our cares and concerns, our joys and our sorrows, touch our hearts and heal us, Lord. Make us ready to become your faithful disciples. Amen. I am going to take a few minutes right now to talk what's going on in the United Methodist Church. I know I don't normally do something like this, but this is really important. And I don't know how much you all are aware of what's going on um, globally with, with the United Methodist Church. This coming week, February 23rd through the 26th, the United Methodist Church is going to have a big vote. Um, this is, is a controversial thing that's been going on since the early 1970s. So it's time to settle it once and for all, and, and that's what's going to happen. And then, of course, the controversy is with um, same-sex marriages. And they were hopefully, hoping to have, um, let me back up a step. Every four years, United Methodists all around the world get together for a general conference. And they were hoping to have a vote on this issue two years ago. Well, as you can well imagine, after 40 years, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a smooth road. So anyway, things were getting out of hand, and what they decided to do is the bishops assigned a group of people from all across the world, um, a commission, to come up with some suggestions on what to specifically vote for around this issue. Now these people have been meeting for two years and, th and now this special session has been called. And what they're going to do is vote on one of three issues to be brought forth to the general conference that's gonna be happening in two years. That's really confusing, I'm sorry about that, but I just feel like I need to, to kind of lay that in wrong work. So what they're going to be voting on, these are the three issues um, that the commission is suggesting. First is, let me get my notes here, first is called the One Church Plan. And what that is, is essentially every church gets to decide how they're going to deal with, um, with same-sex marriage. That along with the pastor that's here. Now, as a pastor, if somebody comes out to me and they ask me to officiate their marriage, and and I know for a fact that it's not a right, it's, it's not going to be good, I already have the ability to say, I, I can't do this all in good conscience. So, so between the church and the people that would want to get married, we can make our own choices. So that's... The suggestion that's the that's what they're going to bring forward as their recommendation for this for this commission um, to be voted on this week the other two plans were um, connectional conference model and this was basically going to the bishops were going to say okay here it is everybody everybody has to adhere to these specific criteria Everybody, no matter what, no matter how you believe, no matter what. Um, they are not recommending that one. And the traditional model would be just status quo. Just keep it the way it is, and nobody fights about it anymore. So, um, if you want more information, I have some, I, I printed out a few of these in the back. Um, and if you would like to have a conversation with me, um, that would be um, awesome as well. Um, I just wanted to make you aware of this because next week is going to be our church conference, our church, big church meeting, and um, the ordained elder that's going to be here, Janine um, Alexander, the pastor of the Coppertop Church in Duluth, um, is, is probably going to talk about this as well. So I just wanted you all to be informed um, and have a conversation if, if you would like to. Um, so, there you go. Yes? What is the status quo? The status quo is how we do it now, that um, 
the United Methodist Church does not, um, we cannot marry same-sex people in the church now. And that's in the Book of Discipline. We are an um, interesting church here because we are kind of a conglomeration of United Methodist and Presbyterian, and, and we have our own bylaws. And so, in the Presbyterian side of things, that's a whole different ballgame, you know. So, um, but we here at United uh, defer to the most restricted policies, and that would be it. All right. So. There we go. I'm done. If you have anything else you want to talk about, that'd be awesome. All right, where am I? Bulletin. <laughs> Please join me now in our prayer of confession. Dear Lord, we rejoice that you find our So 
we need to pray for each other, and we need to, you know, smile at each other, and we need to do nice things for each other, and we need to forgive people, and we need to say our so that we're sorry when we hurt people, right? And we, we need to do that right away, and not, not postpone that stuff for another day. Does that make sense? All right. Let's have a little prayer, okay? Oh, dear God, we have so many earthly treasures here, but help us to be faithful each day and to build up those treasures that we can do so that we have treasures in heaven. Amen. Hey, Carolyn, will you want to do me a favor? When that cold bucket comes around, will you put those coins in there for me, please? Yeah. Can I just take the whole thing and when that bucket comes around, put it in there. Sure. 
Greek lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So ends the reading of God's word. So I'm wondering if you um, made sure and got your rewards um, this morning when you came in. Did you check out with the with the ushers there and got your frequent flyer card stamped? No? Huh. I know how you feel. I, I have problems with that myself. But you may say, ha ha ha, if only that were the case. And I can, you know, after 10 free punches, I don't have to come to church. I don't know, whatever it is. Anyway, reward programs are, are something with which we are, I imagine, all very well acquainted with, right? Remember those SNH green stamps? Oh, those were the best. You lift them and you put them in those books, and then you got a wonderful catalog, and then you traded your stamps in for stuff. How about holiday gas stamps? Remember those? Nine cents and four pages of stamps would get you just about anything. Uh, my, my college roommate and I, that's pretty much how we um, got our food during uh, college years. And I, for one, am really terrible at trying to make those reward points work for me now. The fine print pretty much always puts a roadblock in the way of me cashing in on those big prizes. I'll go to use a coupon and inevitably it'll have expired. Well, we have a T-Mobile cell phone carrier and apparently there's something called T-Mobile Tuesdays where all you have to do is log on, pick a prize, and they send it to you. Well, I usually remember about Thursday, and that's even after they send me a little reminder on Tuesdays. I never, ever, ever can make those things work. But I do know people who are great at making rewards programs work to their greatest advantage. They pay attention to their purchases, and they make it their business to work the system for their benefit. Our son Brad is one such person. He is, if nothing else, tenacious. He, um, at one point, was awarded a gigantic flat screen TV. And he did that by reading the fine print and finding a loop, he found a loophole in it. And he basically wore the legal department down until they caved and they sent him that gigantic TV. I have a whole other story about that, but that's for another time. But all, all that is all well and good, and yet in today's Gospel, Jesus describes just one example of how we get our rewards in God's redemption program, which is one of the best out there. One in which the points never, ever expire. Now, I know some may cringe when we talk about points and rewards in the kingdom of God, which, as St. Paul and generations of theologians since have reminded us, in God's kingdom, it's not about points and rewards at all, but it's all about God's generous acceptance of us. But strangely enough, before St. Paul wrote his letters and epistles and worked out his doctrine of justification by faith, Jesus talked about rewards as he does in our gospel today. 
And those rewards come not only to us who do God's work, such as Jesus' disciples, but also to those who welcome the disciples. Even if it was through a simple act of giving them a cup of cool water. Truly, I say to you, said Jesus, none of these will lose their rewards. Okay, so to whom was he talking and what exactly did he mean? Well, Matthew chapter 10 is all about discipleship. Jesus commissions 12 disciples and sends them out to cure the sick and to drive out evil spirits, to proclaim and to portray the kingdom of God. But then Jesus gets to the fine print. He warns them of coming persecutions and trials. He tells them whom to fear and whom to ignore. He reminds them that their words and their works will spark division. And all of this is part of being a disciple of Jesus. He then calls them to take up their cross, promising rewards for the faithfulness. And I don't mean frequent flyer points. What he says is this. Whomever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. Jesus then ends with the most descriptive promise of all. When he says, whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little, little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So really, is that all it takes? Can it really be so simple as to offer someone a cup of cold water? Note that Jesus isn't even talking about what the disciples are supposed to be doing. He's talking about those who welcome the disciples, even if it is just by giving them a cool cup of water. We're not talking about the apostles and the prophets and the preachers, the so-called superstars of the show. Now we're talking about the bit players, the, the B actors, the people in the background, the people in the pews, the, the people that are, are flocking in the crowds. Yes, even through gestures as small as giving a cup of cold water to those who are thirsty and other acts of mercy and kindness, we too are drawn into the mission of Jesus and that's where we gain our rewards. What this tells us is that Christian discipleship, following Jesus, it doesn't have to be heroic. We don't have to be Albert Schweitzer or Mother Teresa or cure cancer or work miracles. Even something as simple as giving a cold cup of water to those who are thirsty counts in God's rewards program. And once we know this, we can easily think of other things to add to the list, right? Smiling at strangers and greeting them and rather than ignoring and scowling at them. Offering to those who grieve a shoulder to cry on an ear to listen with, welcoming those who are new to the church or school or neighborhood with simple gestures of welcome and friendship, contacting the legislator about an issue that's important to us 
or even more importantly, to someone else, like healthcare, for instance. Supporting those who work in the social services agencies, or food pantries, or soup kitchens, or better yet, doing it ourselves, as those who care for others. All these types of things may seem small and insignificant, maybe even unimportant, except that according to Jesus, in the kingdom of God there are no small gestures that are done in faith. Every act of kindness has an impact beyond what we can imagine. Indeed, Jesus seems to be saying that no act of kindness or generosity will ever be forgotten. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, the simplest acts of kindness are by far more powerful than a thousand heads bowed in prayer. Every act of kindness and generosity reverberates with cosmic significance. And even though we may never know the difference such acts have, have made, every act of kindness, every act of generosity done in the name of Christ ripples out into the world and is gathered into the great wave of God's work to love, to bless, and to save the world. I think we all know what I'm talking about because at some time or another in our lives, every one of us has been the beneficiary of someone's simple, yet extravagant act of kindness. My son and soon-to-be daughter-in-law were about to be married. This is the same son that got this gigantic TV, by the way. They were about to get married, and I casually mentioned that my dress that I would be wearing needed to be hemmed, which I was absolutely capable of doing. Well, the date of the wedding was getting closer and closer and closer, and my friend Rosie asked how that hemming job was going, and I said, not a problem, you know, I can whip that out in about 10, 10 minutes, and no worries, plenty of time. Plenty of time, I told her. And truth be told, I didn't want her to know that I was in a time crunch, because, you know, I'm an adult, so we don't do that sort of thing. Anyway, that afternoon, she showed up at my door, with pins and needles and thread and tape measure and scissors and she she told me to, in a very bossy voice as a matter of fact, put that dress on right now. And needless to say, she took that gigantic task and all the stressor that went along with it completely off my shoulders. That was a huge thing. And yet to her it was nothing big. Perhaps you've had such people in your life, those who influence you through a simple act of kindness and generosity. Well, you never know. You absolutely never know what difference you will make. Whether it's through a simple act of kindness expressed to you by others, or a simple act of kindness expressed by others to you. You never know what a difference it's going to make. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, none of these shall lose their rewards. So let's make that so. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our song of response, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
Jesus felt tender compassion for the suffering people he met. He realized that many workers would be needed for a great harvest of mercy and love. The state you and I are called to this work for the reign of God. This very day you and I are called to a sweet labor of generosity, healing, and peace. Let's bring our gifts then so the ministry of this church will be growing, vibrant witness to God's love. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. Ushers will now wait on us for this morning's offering.
prayers for Ed and Louis Johnson, who are both having medical procedures this week, um, and prayers for Pat as well. Lord, in your mercy. Jen. A prayer of thanks for all the people that put on the dinner last night. It was just wonderful. It didn't look like a fellowship hall. It looked like a nightclub. <laughs> it was really nice. And the food was good. And anybody that didn't go should go next year. <laughs> it was wonderful. And so many people helped. And a special prayer to those boys who did the music. Oh, my really goodness. Things. They were wonderful. So sorry for you that weren't there, but gosh, it was a good time. And we danced. Huh. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Zach. Prayers for everyone. Prayers for everyone. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Did you have another one, Katya? No. Okay. Phyllis. I think uh, a prayer for um, Margaret Larson, who had hip surgery. Mm -hmm. Prayers for healing from Margaret Larson who had hip surgery. Lord, in your mercy. On the prayers of thanks and celebration for Isabel, Isabel Westman, who is being commissioned today as the pastor at Bassett Congregational Church on the Prayers for Isabel um, Westman, who is being um, commissioned today as the new pastor up in um, Bassett. Community Church. Lord, in your mercy. If there are no more prayers, requests, let us pray. We look to heaven, O oh God, in search of your likeness, but we do not find it there. Instead, we find it here on earth in Jesus Christ, not as the result of our search, but for you, but as the result of your search for us. Sometimes we stray, but you are always close and you hear our cry. You never abandon us. And not only do you forgive us when we misuse what has been given to us, you pursue us with a love that will not let us stay away. For the assurance that while we may be late in our repentance, it is not too late for your forgiveness. And the assurance that even though our love may let go of you, your love will never let go of us. We give you thanks. We're tempted by the world in which we live. We live in a land rich in harvest and culture, steeped in learning, an economy famous for its technology, political system envied by for its democratic traditions. We may not be tempted to betray our God to own all the world's food, but we have been known to put more money toward a dinner bill than toward feeding the hungry. We may, may not be willing to betray our God to control the world's people, but we have been known to use our ac access to resources to protect and hoard our riches. Give us courage, hearts that will not let us hide from the suffering of friends and enemies. Give us shoulders broad and strength that we may walk with the wounded. When this journey is done, call us from the wilderness that we might reveal the source of our lives by the way we live them. Let us dedicate our harvest to the war on star starvation our learning to the war, war on ignorance, our technology to the war on misery, our democracy to the war on oppression. Call us to be with those whose souls and bodies need your soothing touch. We ask it in the name of the one through whom we know life, praying together as he taught the disciples, saying, Our Father, Lord to heaven,
And now we have a few announcements. Number one being, you know, well, first off, there's a whole bunch in, in the insert of the bulletin, but um, our congregational, annual congregational meeting is going to be held next Sunday, directly after church. Um, so you can see, oh, yep. And the, um, the annual reports, there's some right behind um, on, the, on the little bench thing behind, um, in the back there, <laughs> or behind one hour. And um, we're also going to be e emailing them all, so everybody will have a chance to get them on email as well. So that is done. Are there any other announcements that you would like to lift up? All right. Well, that being the case, do not ever be afraid to welcome others. Bring your welcoming, accepting spirits to all whom you meet. May God go with you on your journey this week and all of your days. Please stand as you're able for our ascending song. The Lord sends us forth. Mm -hmm. 